Ho, 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 dokie. Welcome to this week's quick quiz lesson. In this video, we'll be covering some of the big ideas in 1524's quiz 10. In not quite 15 minutes, or it's like a little over 15 minutes. I'm sorry. <sighs> Let's get started. F of X to F prime relationship. So when the original function f of x is increasing or has a positive slope, f prime of x, its derivative, will have a positive y value. In other words, on a graph, it'll be above the x-axis. When f of x is decreasing or has a negative slope, f prime of x will have negative y values. Or on a graph, it'll be below the x-axis. For example, in this problem, we are given the graph of f prime of x. So basically, wherever the curve is above the x-axis or has positive y values, f of x should be increasing. And wherever this curve is below the x-axis or has negative y values, f of x will be decreasing. And so if we direct our attention at a, they say increasing from 5 to 7, which is true because from 5 to 7, this function is above the x-axis. And then number 2, they say decreasing over 2 to 4. From 2 to 4, that curve is below the x-axis. So that is correct. And statement 3, decreasing over 8 to 9, is also true because from 8 to 9, this curve is below the x-axis. All three statements are true, so we break out the eraser to see that A is our answer, and we're done. And in this example, they give us the graph of marginal profit. Keep in mind, marginal profit is just the derivative of profit. So this is the same thing as if they just gave us the graph of P prime. And wherever P prime is above the x-axis, P is increasing. In other words, wherever marginal profit is above the x-axis, profit is increasing. And wherever marginal profit is below the x-axis, profit is decreasing. So where profit changes from increasing to decreasing is right around here. And so we look for that value in our answer choices and we realize that to the left of point 0.8, profit is increasing because marginal profit's above the x-axis. And to the right of point 0.8, profit is decreasing because marginal profit is below the x-axis. So B is our answer and we're done. Last week, we learned that a relative max is where the function f changes from increasing to decreasing. And we also learned that a relative minimum is where f changes from decreasing to increasing. And so if we apply these new rules, a relative max will be where f prime changes from positive to negative. And a relative min will be where f prime changes from negative to positive. In other words, if we're looking at the graph of f prime, a relative max will be where it crosses from above to below the x-axis. A relative min will be where f prime crosses from below the x-axis to above the x-axis. Here it is just a little more organized. All right. For example, in this problem, we're given the graph of f prime, and we want to find where f has local maxes and mins. By the way, wherever you see local max and local min, that's the same thing as relative max and relative min. So it might help first to realize that anywhere that f prime is above the x-axis, that is where f of x is increasing. And anywhere f prime is below the x-axis, that is where f is decreasing. And so if we think about it, the points on this graph where f is changing from increasing to decreasing, in other words, where f prime is changing from above to below or below to above the x-axis will just be at every single one of these x-intercepts. And so starting with the first one, from left to right, this point is changing from positive to negative y value. In other words, from above to below the x-axis. Therefore, this point is a maximum. And the second point is changing from below to above or negative to positive y values. So this is a minimum. And if we keep going, this point is where f has a max and this point might be where f has a min. So now with all of these labeled, it's easy to see that c is our answer. We have a local min here and a local max here and we're done. So let's think about what we learned from this one. If on this graph of f prime, we were finding where f had maxes and mins by looking at the x-intercepts, and x-intercepts are where y is equal to zero, but in this case, our y is f prime. So really, f will have a max or a min wherever f prime is equal to zero. So in other words, in order for f to have either a max or a min, f prime must be equal to zero. And that makes some sense if we think about these relative maxes and mins. If f prime needs to change from positive to negative or negative to positive, that means f prime must equal zero in between because you can't go from positive to negative or negative to positive without hitting zero. 
We can apply this idea to a problem like this. In this problem, we're given f prime as a factored function, and our goal is to find the graph of f. And so if we just find where f prime is equal to zero, we can find the x values for which f has maxes or mins. And so if we set x minus seven times x minus one equal to zero and solve for x, we set each of these factors equal to zero, add seven to get x equals seven, and add one to get x equals one. And so from these original factors, we get these x values. These are the x values for which f prime is equal to zero. And when f prime equals zero, f has a possibility of having a max or a min. And so in this case, you can just assume there will be maxes and mins at one and seven. So when we scan through our options here, we wanna see the graph of f that has maxes or mins at one and seven. We can eliminate options c and d. I wanna make clear that these are the graphs of f now, not f prime, so we will not find maxes and mins at the x-intercepts but instead we will find maxes and mins at the high points and low points, high points and low points. And now a quick check to see which one is our answer. What we can do is plug in x equals zero into f prime and calculate a value. When we do that, we get negative seven times negative one or just seven. The significance of this is that seven is positive. And if f prime of zero is positive, what that means is the slope of f at zero is positive. So at x equals zero on both these graphs, a has a negative slope and b has a positive slope. And so B is our answer, and we're done. So here's a similar example. We're given F prime in factored form, and the goal is to find the graph of F. We'll start by setting F prime equal to zero and solving for X. And so from each of these factors, we get five, one, and negative four. Again, these X values should be the locations of F's maxes or mins. And so in this case, we wanna look at X equals five, X equals one, and X equals negative four on this graph. The issue is five is not really shown on this graph, and negative four is sort of right on the edge, so it's sort of hard to tell. But if we look at X equals one, we can narrow it down to two options that either have a max or a min at one. Green has a max and pink has a min at x equals one. So we eliminate orange and blue. And the last step is to do the same thing we did last time and just plug in zero to the f prime function. And again, all we're focused on is the overall sign at the end. Negative five is negative. Negative one is negative. Positive four is positive. Negative times negative times positive is a positive. And so if f prime of zero is positive, that means the slope of the function f at x equals zero is positive. And so if we look at the curves pink and green, specifically if we look at x equals zero, we're looking for the color with the positive slope. Pink has a negative slope at x equals zero, but green has a positive slope at x equals zero. And so green is our answer and we're done. One note about this is you don't have to plug in zero every time, but if it works, then use it because it's a nice number. But really you could plug in any other number that was not one of these numbers. And in this problem, we're given f of x in factored form, but now each of these factors have a certain exponent. So from each of our factors, we can still gather the x values for which f prime is equal to zero. But in this case, there might not be maxes and mins at all of these x values. Keep in mind for a max and a min, we need f prime to change from positive to negative or negative to positive. And so what we wanna do is check to see if f prime actually changes sign about each of these x values. So we can make a little number line with our x values and then f prime values up top. And what we'll do is pick x values to the left and right of each of our other x values. And our goal here is to plug these x values into f prime and figure out whether it'll give us a positive or negative. Now this seems very tedious, but let's talk through what happens. If we plug in x equals negative three, here, here, and here, we'll get this. So we could calculate what this or this equals, but it won't matter because if these exponents are even, then these results will automatically be positive. So then if we look in the middle here, negative three minus three, is negative six and negative six to an odd exponent will be negative. So really we wanna ask ourselves what's a positive times negative times positive and that is negative. And so just like that, we found that plugging in negative three gave us a negative for F prime. So keep in mind, it does not matter what we plug into X minus nine nor X plus two because their exponents are even so it'll always be positive. So really the sign of F prime is solely coming from this middle factor. So if we plug in our next value zero, we get negative three to the 11 and a negative raised to an odd power is also negative. And so again, we get positive, negative, positive, which means that F prime is negative at X equals zero. So now if we plug in four, we just get one to the 11th and that's positive. So three positives multiplied together tells us that F prime is positive at X equals four. So now just one more, if we plug in X equals 10, we get seven to the 11th, a positive raised to the 11th is still positive. All of these multiplied together give us positive, which means that F prime is positive at X equals 10. 
So now as we analyze our number line, we're focused on negative 2, 3, and 9 because those were the possible locations for f's, maxes, or min's. If we look at x equals negative 2, namely to the left and right of negative 2, we see that f prime goes from negative to negative, which means there's no change from positive to negative or negative to positive, which means that at x equals negative 2, there's no max or min. So now if we look at x equals 3, we see that from left to right, f prime changes from negative to positive. And using this definition, this means that f has a minimum at x equals 3. And for the last one, if we're looking at x equals 9, we see that f prime goes from positive to positive, which means that there is no change in the sign of f prime. So that means f has no max or min at x equals 9. And so with this information, we just pick our best answer, and that is option D, and we're done. A super important lesson is this. F did not have a max or min at negative 2 or 9 because of these factors up at the top. There was no max or min at negative 2 or 9 because these factors had even exponents. And because they had even exponents, it did not allow the sign to change from left to right of either of these x values. It was only the case that x equals 3, which came from the middle factor, had a max or a min because x minus 3's exponent was odd. So when you have even exponents, those x values will not have local extrema. But when they have odd exponents, those x values will have either a max or a min. But then it takes creating a number line to actually check whether the sign changes from positive to negative or negative to positive to tell whether you have a max or a min. In this question, they ask, what is the absolute max of this function on this interval? The process will look like this. We're going to find f prime, 3x squared over 3, minus 2x over 2, minus 2. And if we simplify this, 3's cancel, 2's cancel, and we're just left with x squared minus x minus 2. Anytime we're finding maxes and mins, we set f prime equal to 0. In this case, we want to factor. We want two numbers that multiply to negative 2, but add to negative 1. So we have x minus 2 and x plus 1. From each of the factors, we get x equals 2 and x equals negative 1. These are the possible locations of a max or a min. In this case, the absolute max. And then last week, we also learned that if a function has endpoints, then f could also have an absolute max at one of these endpoints. And so if it's only possible for the function to have an absolute max at either this x value, this x value, this x value, or this x value, then what we need to do is just plug all four of these x values individually into our original function function and find which one gives us the highest value. The highest y value will correspond to the absolute max. So in this table, I've just put our four x values and now we'll calculate the f values by plugging the x values into the original function. When we do so, we get all these f values, basically all these y values, and we look for the absolute highest y value because in this case, we're looking for the absolute max. So the highest y value we see is 3.33, and that corresponds to 10 thirds. That's option D, and we're done. If this question had asked for an absolute minimum instead, the process would have been exactly the same, except we would have looked for the absolute lowest y value at the very end, in which case our answer would have been negative 9.67. One more distinction to bring up, in this case it's very important to recognize, because they're asking for the actual absolute max or absolute min, all these answer choices are referring to y values. So you never want to answer with one of these x values, the answer will always come from the y values f of x to f double prime relationships yeah so when the second derivative f double prime is positive that means that f the original function will be concave up and when the second derivative f double prime is negative f of x the original function will be concave down if we're ever given the graph of f double prime if f double prime is positive that's just another way of saying it's above the x-axis and same thing down here if f double prime is negative if you have the f double prime graph that's just another way of saying the curve is below the x-axis so so if we look at this problem, we are given the graph of f double prime, and the goal is to identify the graph of f. And so if we really just use this above and below the x-axis technique, we see that f double prime is above the x-axis from the start until about just after 3, and then it changes to below the x-axis. So what this means is that at the start, f should be concave up, and then it should change to concave down. So we're looking for the graph that starts concave up and switches to concave down, and that is option D. Concave up, concave down. And that's all there is to it. We're done.
In this problem, they give you a function and they're asking about whether this function's concave up or down over certain intervals. So I'll leave this one for you to try, but I'll give you the steps to go about it. Anytime they're talking about concavity, concave up, concave down, you'll want to find the second derivative, f double prime. So in order to do that, you'll find the first derivative, then find the derivative of that function to get the second derivative. Then for each of these statements, what you'll do is pick an x value that's on this interval. For example, that first interval, you could pick x equals negative five. And what you'll do is plug in negative five to f double prime. If you plug in negative five and you get a positive, that means that f is concave up. And that statement would be true because they say it's concave up. If you plug in negative five to f double prime and you get a negative value, that would mean f is concave down. And that statement would be false. So then repeat this process with the remaining statements and you should end up getting e as your answer. Feel free to give it a shot. And last week, we learned how an inflection point is where the function changes from concave up to concave down or from concave down to concave up. And so if we apply these rules here, an inflection point is where f double prime changes from positive to negative or where f double prime changes from negative to positive. And if f double prime is changing from positive to negative or negative to positive, to be more specific for an inflection point to occur, f double prime must equal zero. And f double prime must change sign from the left to the right right of that point. So in this problem, we'll be able to use that shortcut we learned from 622b. That shortcut was using these factors, more specifically their exponents, to identify whether or not we would have local extrema. But that problem dealt with f prime. In this problem, we're dealing with f double prime, which deals more with inflection points as opposed to relative extrema. Again, for an inflection point to occur, f double prime needs to equal zero. So we can find all the x values for which f prime equals zero pretty easily. Here they are. But then the key is the exponents. If the exponents are odd, that's what allows f double prime to change signs. Therefore, at x equals eight and x equals two, we will have inflection points because the sign will change. But for this last factor, x plus one to the sixth, that exponent is even. When an exponent is even, it will not allow the sign to change. Therefore, there will be no inflection point at negative one. So in this case, C is our answer and we're done. And for this last problem, I'll let you try it on your own, but I'll give you the steps to go about it. It uses just a little bit of everything we've learned in this lesson. We are given a function, g of x, and we wanna find the g values at the local min, max, and inflection points. And what you'll do first is find the derivative. Once you find the derivative, you'll set it equal to zero, and then you'll have to factor it to solve for the two x values. While factoring, make sure to pull out a greatest common factor first. Once you find the two x values for which f prime is equal to zero, these will be the locations of your maxes and your mins. Instead of doing a number line to identify which one's the max, which one's the min, you can just plug the x values into the original function. Whichever g or y value is higher will be your max, whichever g value is lower will be your min. The next step will be to go back to that original f prime function you found, the first derivative, and then take its derivative to find f double prime. Then you will set f double prime equal to zero and solve for x. This x value will be the location of your inflection point. And then all you have to do to find the g value of the inflection point is just plug this x value into the original function, and that'll give you the g value at the inflection point. Once you have this g value, this g value, and this g value, you will pick the answer that has two of these three correct values. When you do so, you should get A. Give it a shot. <laughs> All right, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you wanna stay updated for more quick quiz lessons this semester, go ahead and subscribe. If you wanna connect with me or other students in the same course as you or ask me questions or anything else, join the Discord. That's all for this week's quick quiz lesson. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Ah, 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 all right.